Welcome everyone to today's webinar hosted by the Institute of Navigation titled Navigating the Suez Canal. Today's webinar will be moderated by ION Fellow Doug Tagger. Doug has made foundational pioneering and high impact contributions to multiple navigation systems during his career as an engineer, manager, and policy developer, and has played a critical role in shaping national and international PNT policies. Mr. Taggart has been a strong advocate for navigation signal spectrum protection and a strong believer that a prudent navigator must rely upon all sources of navigation information. Mr. Taggart received his Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from the United States Coast Guard Academy and a Master of Science in Electrical Engineering from Purdue University. So thank you for being here and I'll turn it over to Doug. Thank you very much, Rick. I appreciate that introduction. Today's webinar is being presented by Captain Morgan McManus. Captain McManus is a graduate of the State University of New York, SUNY Maritime College, class of 1992, with a Bachelor of Science in Marine Transportation. He holds a United States Coast Guard Master Unlimited Tonnage License with an Offshore Installation Manager endorsement. In 2007, he took command of the SS Cape Jacob Military Sea Left Command Ready Reserve Force Ship, carrying ordnance for the U.S. Navy throughout the Pacific. His sailing career has taken him on various types of commercial ships, including steam, motor, brake ball, container, car carriers, tankers, and cutting-edge dynamic positioning drill ships. Captain McManus has also served as a watch officer aboard the training ship Empire State uh, 6 during summer sea cruises, and he actually took command as uh, the ship's master in 2019. Captain McManus has navigated large sh ships throughout the narrow Suez Canal multiple times from both the north and south and has a firsthand knowledge of the high risk and unique challenges involved in successfully traveling through the canal. Following Captain McManus' presentation here today, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. Just click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit a question. So thank you all for being here. And now I'll turn it over to Captain McManus. Thank you, Doug. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first, let me apologize if I speak too quickly. I was born and raised in New York City, so I tend to go quick through things. So if I'm speaking too quick, uh, Doug will give me the stop sign to slow me down a bit. <laughs> um, but while everyone was joining, we were watching a, a time lapse video clip of going through the Suez, and it reminded me of a few of my transits. Uh, I always come at these things from the human element point of view. Uh, technology is great, and we have wonderful navigation aids that help us, whether it's GPS or radar, but uh, human element of a canal transit is one that I seem to focus on because of going through it several times. You know, the canal transit itself is about 12 to 16 hours long from start to finish, but it's the lead up to that, the 24 hours beforehand and the 24 hours afterwards that are also part of it. So really a canal transit's almost like a two day event. Um, you have the convoys are setting up on either side of the canal, whether you're on the, the med side, um, or the Red Sea side, and you have to be there by 2300, 11 p.m. And then the convoy starts at 0330 from the Suez side and 0400, excuse me, backwards, 0400 from the Suez side and 0330 from the Med side to go through. So, you know, leading up to that, the navigation officer and the bridge team are dealing with traffic and weather conditions and a heightened sense of alertness as they approach the canal. And then once they get off the canal, they're anchoring for a few hours or drifting before they go through. They then get in their convoy, they start their paperwork with the canal authority to make sure everything, all their documentation is correct. The pilot gets on board and then they start that transit. Now that transit usually is 12 to 16 hours depending on the speed of the convoy. Most convoys set up at eight to 10 knots depending on the amount of ships in the convoy and the weather conditions. Uh, and then the convoys will start. Originally, before the locks were expanded, which was in 2016, they added the secondary canal, you had the single points. So in Bitter Lake, which uh, there's a little uh, video we'll show later on, there's a place where the ships would actually pass each other before continuing. And sometimes the convoys would get an opportunity to anchor. And that was a good thing in the sense that it gave the crew rest. 
but it also created a chance of something going wrong with uh, anchoring or pulling your anchor up and close navigation with other vessels. So now without that, the convoys tend to pass each other uh, through the dual lane section and then keep on going uh, on the journey. Um, navigation through the canal is challenging in the, in the one aspect that it's, it's a narrow canal. So the larger your ship is going through the canal, the greater uh, chance of error from wind affecting the sailor area of the vessel, like your large container ships or uh, your deep draft, which can be as deep as 60 feet now with the dredging of the canal. So if a uh, ship is moving too fast through the canal, you could have hydrodynamic effects, which is basically your banking and cushioning off the canal walls. So if you visualize all that mass of ship underwater, that's pushing water and it creates actually a low pressure and a high pressure on the side of the hull, which if we all remember the Ever Given, uh, the Ever Given wasn't pushed by wind to have its accident. It was actually bank and cushion that caused it to veer sharply and wedge into the canal. So those are things that you have to think about on the larger ships that are moving through the canal. Um, and that's where speed becomes into play. The canal rules are set up that the distance between each ship is not a set distance. It's basically what's for safe navigation. So a lot of the canal transit, you spend time focusing on the ship ahead of you and the ship behind you. Because if you have a problem, you don't want the ship behind you hitting you. And if the ship ahead of you has a problem, you need to react quick enough to, to deal with it. Um, AIS or automated identification system, which is radio-based transponders has really helped mitigate that risk because that is allowing your ship information and other ship information to be put on your electronic chart. So you kind of have an overview as you're going through the canal. The one cautionary tale with that is where the antenna is mounted. If uh, a tanker is behind you that's a thousand feet long and their antenna for that information is mounted on the bridge, and they don't have that offset put into it, and you're ahead of that tanker, the bow of that tanker is a thousand feet closer than the position being transmitted. So, you know, you have to overlay that information with your radar information, right, which is, you know, coming off your ship, and then you have to take your GPS information, you overlay that all into your Ectus chart, and that gives you a good presentation, but um, anyone will tell you that the best thing to do is look out the window. So most of the canal pilots will tell the helmsman to steer for the ship ahead of them, which works great as long as the ships are similar in dimensions and size. Uh, if you're on a loaded tanker and you're told to aim for the stern light or the stern of a car carrier, well, the car carrier has more sail area. So they might be crabbing in the channel for wind where the tanker might not be doing that. So it's, a, it's one of those things that you have to use all, all the information you're getting to safely navigate the canal. Uh, another part of the transit, and this is back to the human element of it, is when you get on, when the pilot gets on, they're an advisor. They don't take any liability for the canal transit. Uh, the master or the captain of the ship is still ultimately responsible for what goes on. But there's also an exchange of information and an implied trust between a captain and a pilot boarding. You know, the, the pilot is coming on board with his knowledge of the canal and, and having it memorized and knowing the weather patterns. And the captain has to trust that that pilot's coming on with that knowledge. Just the same way the pilot's coming on and has to trust that the captain is reporting that there's no defects to the ship and everything's operating properly and it's in a safe mode of navigation and there's, there's no hindrance to uh, helm commands or the engines operating. So there's a mutual trust and it's almost a blind mutual trust. But what also happens sometimes is you can have a language breakdown between the pilot and the crew. Uh, English is supposed to be the, the, the language of the industry, but, you know, there's a tendency to, uh, other than the United States and, and some of the Western European countries, English is a second language for probably 90% of the mariners out there. So you tend to have a breakdown in communication and a miscommunication. So that's something that always has to be factored in to navigating the canal. You know, helm commands, starboard to go to the right, port to go to the left, making sure the helmsman on the wheel is understanding those commands coming from the pilot. And that's the job of the master of the ship and the watch officer to check that and, and ensure that's happening. The issue becomes that as the transit goes on, fatigue starts setting in more and more. So the error chain gets greater and greater, the chance of a, of a of miscommunication happening, causing an incident to happen on the ship. 
once the transit is completed, you're still not out of the woods yet because now you then have to get your ship, what they call loading it up on the program to come up to sea speed after you leave the canal. You're in heavy, dense traffic. You have traffic that's inbound for the canal as you're leaving. Uh, everyone else is fatigued. You're also now put in overtaking situations where these are situations that develop over time. And you really have to, um, you have to be sharp. So after uh, 24 hours before the 12 hour transit and now into the third day of it almost, you know, fatigue is really an issue and, and is always concerning. It, the tools of navigation that help us mitigate that fatigue is, is your rectus, your electronic charts. You know, there, there are ways of instantly knowing your position so you can then get a good overview of where you are and how you're moving. It's just the interpretation of that data. Um, the, the canal transit itself is fairly simple in, in the fact that there are no locks to the canal. It's just basically, you know, as we affectionately call it a ditch, all right? It's been dug out through the, through the opening. Uh, there's rock and steel revampments on the side to prevent erosion. And that's why they minimize the speed going through. Also from a safety point of view, they have bollards set up about every 125 meters apart. So in the event there is an emergency, a ship can lay alongside, tie up, deal with it. Um, depending on what section of the canal, it might stop the whole convoy or the ship might be able to get aside to let the rest of the convoy go past. Uh, a lot of times ships will anchor in Bitter Lake, which is where they can then take care of any repairs that need to be made if they can't lay alongside. But those are, those are the big challenges of the canal transit. Uh, weather is a factor at all times, as I was saying earlier, wind becomes an issue, but also uh, local sandstorms become an issue and that affects your visibility. That affects also your radar as far as how that's going to uh, affect your return on the radar. It affects GPS with just noise interference in the atmosphere. So again, looking out the window is preferred, but then all of a sudden your visibility goes down to you can't see the bow of your ship. Therefore, you can't see the ship ahead of you. Uh, those always become issues. The canal itself is well marked with buoys and actually almost like mile marker post on a highway. So pilots and navigators can know where they are in relationship to the canal um, at all times during the transit. But those are some of the issues that pop up during the transit. Um, the size of the ships going through is, is they're getting larger and larger. My time going through, and that was 10 years ago, was I think I was trying to figure out the last time I went through it was prior to the expansion of the canal. But I was going through on a thousand foot ship and we were drawing, you know, we were drawing probably 10, 12 meters. Now they have ships going through that are drawing 20 meters um, and, you know, or 1200 feet long. So the crew size hasn't changed though. You're still about 19 to 20 people on board. And again, there goes that fatigue issue of making sure everyone's functioning and alert to, to handle the stress of going through the canal. Uh, on average, you have about 55 to 70 ships a day transiting the canal in the north and southbound convoys. So you want to, I'll stop there just to see if anyone has any questions. Other no, there's no uh, questions posted as of yet, um, but I encourage everyone, if you have a question, please type it in and we'll, uh, we'll get to it. I did, did, did see a question just pop up, uh, Captain, if you'd like me to go at it right now. Sure. question was asked about um, is, is dredging needed? And if so, how often and uh, how does it affect the, those canal traffic uh, during those periods of dredging? Sure. Uh, yeah, the Suez Canal Authority does do uh, regular dredging operations. They try to time it so the dredging equipment will stay off to the side as a convoy goes past. The equipment comes back out and then they, they do their dredging. You, you have a little bit of, of silting that happens in the canal. Um, it's not really a tidal issue, but they do have to take care of the silting. Uh, the big issue is, like I was saying, the, the stone and, and revampments, the metal revampments, keep the erosion from coming into the canal. But they do regular maintenance dredging on it. Um, you know, when the canal first opened in 1869, it was maybe... Um, I believe six meters deep. So they've dredged it to make it not only for maintenance, but to accommodate deeper vessels as, as they've been going on.
but regular dredging occurs. Okay, thank you. I have one other question and we'll let you continue on here. Um, the question is, is one more one direction more difficult than the other, uh, north, south, south, north transit? Uh, personally, I, I enjoyed going northbound. Uh, I thought it was easier from the sense that when, you know, when we exited into the Mediterranean, it was it was it was more open water for navigation. It was easier to get clear of traffic. You know, when you're southbound and you come out in Suez, you're now navigating through the Red Sea. It's narrow. It's it's very tight. You, know, you have a lot of fishing boats there that are most of the fishing boats are made of wood. They don't show up well on radar. Um, I, I for me personally, the northbound transit was always uh, easier. Plus, usually it was on my leg. I was going home, so I, I was motivated that you know I only had a couple more weeks to go in my contract, and I was getting off. I have another question here that just popped up, um, and then I'll ask one myself here. Um, is there a concern with GPS spoofing or denial that may cause significant navigation problems, recognizing, as you have mentioned, there's a lot of visual activity that's taking place? And uh, therefore, how, how dependent is GPS uh, during an actual transit? Yeah, so uh, you know, GPS again, it's a great tool. And originally, when GPS came online, and I'm old enough to know, we we didn't trust the the GPS because we didn't trust the hardware. But now, the issue with spoofing and trusting the software, um, again, prudent navigation, you rely on many many sources of information. So um, you know, if the GPS is not looking like it's lining up with your visual or your radar aids. You know, um, most bridge procedures or, or most standing orders that a captain would have for the watch would be to alert them when that happens. Majority of the pilots don't rely on GPS. They have it memorized and they're relying on their visual bearings that they have. But again, human beings, were creatures of, uh, you know, if something's going to make our life easier, we're going to rely on it. So as, uh, as I say to the students here, don't get your face locked in a screen, look out the window. So it's, a, but it is a concern. It does happen. Uh, I've been through the canal also where radar has been interfered with, and we never knew quite what the interference was coming from. Was it interference from other ships or was it shore side interference? There are sections of canal where the radar display would just not match up to anything we were looking at just from clutter and interference. So again, you have to rely on your, uh, your visual aids to, to back you up on that information. Okay, um, just a question of my own here. Um, recognizing the number of ships that you mentioned on a particular transit, maybe as many as 70, um, how does it, how does, is there a, a means to, for example, a cruise ship, does it, with passengers on board, does it have any different set of priorities than a cargo uh, ship, et cetera? Um, is there a hierarchy of how ships are assigned in the convoy? Yeah, so, the, and the, the inner workings of the, the canal authority, I'm not sure, but I do know that, you know, the toll rates are different for different vessels based on the cargo they're carrying, the type of vessel. So a passenger vessel would have a higher toll rate than a, a bulk freighter ship. So therefore it'd probably move up faster in the queue of the convoy to go through. Um, sometimes your higher security vessels would actually go last in the convoy. This way, if there was, when they got to that two-way approach, there was no risk of them having to anchor, pull aside, they'd be able to keep steaming straight through. Um, so, you know, more, the priority usually happens with safety. So LNGs, your liquefied natural gas ships, and some of your chemical carriers will require different escorts of tug services to escort them through because of their, their high risk of their cargo. So the, those are usually how they figure that out, more on a safety um, and then the toll rate. All right, any other questions right now? Or go ahead, Captain, if you had. Well, actually, I was just, uh, the one, I saw one here that popped up about uh, the second canal adding more value to facilitate navigation through the canal. Uh, the second canal was amazing. First off, they did it in a year, which was incredible. They dug that second canal in a year's time. It is, uh, is an incredible story of engineering how they pulled that off. But yes, it, it increased the amount of traffic that can go through the canal, also the larger vessels, which in turn helped commerce tremendously. And when you think about 
the, the magnitude of billions of dollars of freight that moved through the Suez Canal, northbound and southbound. You know, the whole reason for the canal was to cut down the transit between uh, Asia and Europe. And, you know, they shaved almost, I, I think it was, if I remember correctly, uh, about 5,500, 6,000 miles off the transit of having to go around Africa. So that, that adds up to three weeks of a journey, you know. So time is money with shipping and with just-in-time inventory around the world. That, that second canal lane definitely helped with allowing more volume through the canal, but also too, in the event there is an issue, you now have redundancy. So, you know, if they can get around it, I, the problem you go back with the Ever Given is the Ever Given had its incident in the one section, in the section of the canal that was still single. Whereas if the Ever Given had its incident further up where the dual canal lanes were, it could have been in that and the other side of the canal could have stayed open. So. Yes, the the, uh, the second canal in 2016 definitely helps, and it's definitely increased commerce globally. I don't see any other questions popping up right now. Um, let you continue. Um, you know. What was that question? I can answer that question if they, you know, um, it's so the ever given, the incident of the ever given, the, the one thing amazing about that is there were ships that size have been going through the canal for years already. Um, I, I don't think that the size of the ship really was the, the, the risk. I think it was the, the actions of the human beings involved with, um, if you look at all the data, they were, they were going too fast. Um, and speed, they, they lost they lost ability to steer. The helmsman overcompensated for a course correction, which caused the stern of the ship to get too close to that bank. So um, I, I think the size of the ships going through it wasn't really the issue. Again, it, was the, it comes down to the human part of it. You could have all this great technology and, and all these great uh, abilities to help you with the ship and navigate. But a rule for going through the canal is you're not on autopilot, you're in hand steering. So you have that human interaction, and that that was really the uh, the issue with the ever given. But as far as the size of the ship goes through, you know, when you look at the amount of volume that goes through and the amount of incidents that happen, they are very few. Yeah, just with regard to as you just commented, you're not allowed to use autopilot. Um, do you think at any point, um, based on characteristics of ships and the auto uh, pilot capabilities? Autonomous canal transit would ever be in the in the possibility. I, I do. I, I do think it's in the realm of possibilities. I, I think if you were to take a page from, you know, dynamic positioning and and how vessels can work within, you know, twenty meters, fifty meters of each other and hold station by using reflectors and 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 laser um, ranging, I, I do think eventually we'd get to a point where there could be some level of semi-autonomous. Where you still have the, the the crew on board, but you know maybe it would be in a form of autopilot that's working off of ranges that are on the sides running parallel to the canal, that are then giving the data to the ship to know whether it's in the middle of the canal or left of center or right of center as it transits through. So I think that technology probably will be developed in the future. Um, I don't think it'll get to the point of autonomous. I think there'll always be a human element involved, but I do see some form of um, increase navigation, you know, auto automation to help with that transit and, and maybe to remove some of those human elements that could cause the incident to happen. The, the one thing is, you, you know, it's garbage in, garbage out, right? So if the data coming into the ship is not perfect, then you're going to have a, a, you know, the automation would have a, a, a negative response. You know, if the data is saying that the ship is 50 meters to the left when it's really 50 meters to the right, well, if you're on a ship with only 10 meters of clearance on either side, you, you're now running into the side of the bank. So it, it's going to take some more time to get there, but I do eventually think we'll get there. Okay. Are there mandatory uh, carriage equipage requirements for a ship to make a transit right now? AIS, ECTUS, et cetera. Yes, AIS, ECTUS, uh, two different GPSs, receivers, uh, two different radars, an X-band and an S-band radar. Um, you know, 
the redundancy in your steering system. If you have a, if you cannot switch your steering systems over to the secondary system, you have to notify the canal authority about that. Depending on the ship, they won't allow you to transit or they'll have you transit with an escort tug. But, um, you know, basically it's almost no different than um, doing an arrival gear test to any other port. You have to show the canal authority that and document that everything on your ship that's required by regulation is working properly. Any other questions right now? Seeing none, turn it back over to you, Cap. Um, I, I think one thing to take away is, is with all the advances, you know, it has increased the volume of traffic going through. You know, it with the size of the ships is one thing, but also with adding the lane in 2016, it did increase the amount of ships that can transit the canal. Uh, if you ever look at a, a hot map showing the traffic, you can see the volume on both ends of the canal. And it, it definitely has made it, a, 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 I wouldn't say a more dangerous, but it's also just a, a, it's a, it's a high stress event. Um, so those are things that all come into play. Uh, just look at some questions real quick. Yeah, there are landmarks when, to, for the navigation process. Uh, they have the buoy, the buoys along it, as well as the day markers going through with the number with which are numbered in sequence. There's several bridges that cross over the canal, and those are check-in points. Um, one thing I, I failed to mention earlier with that AIS system is the ability of shoreside the, with the Suez Canal Authority's vessel traffic system. They get to manage a bird's eye view of all the ships going through, and they can check on speed and. Uh, where they are in relationship to the ship ahead or ship astern of you, behind you. And they can notify pilots if they need to speed up or slow down based on what they're seeing. So, you know, there is a, a kind of like a big, big eye view of what's going on through the canal, which didn't exist uh, years back. You know, years back at the canal authority, the, the pilots would call on VHF radio. They'd check in when they were reaching different points of it. Uh, the canal authority would have a radar interpretation or, you know, some now they have CCTV so they can really see where the ships are transiting through. So it helps with that. And uh, yeah, the canal's 24 <laughs> seven. It's, it never shuts down unless there's an incident there. Um, but they try to limit the convoy. So you have the, the northbound convoy and the southbound convoy. And, and those happen because of the time it takes for the transit at basically 3.30 and 4 a.m. they start and then they go through. And by the end of the day, you're exiting on the other side between four and six, eight o'clock at night. And then they're setting up for the next convoy. You know, everyone has to be checked in by 11 p.m. or 2300 on their respective sides. And then they start that convoy. So it's a 24-7 operation, but it's really a timed operation. Um, you know, and it, it's really is very well organized in that sense. They've had tons of time to practice it over the years and develop these convoy systems and they have it, they have it dialed in pretty well. I had a couple questions here just about a uh, transit um, in terms of crew rest schedule. I think that's probably unique to, to every particular vessel uh, that's going through, but as you, I think early on mentioned the captain is required to be on the bridge the entire transit. Is that is that correct? Yeah, yeah. The, uh, it's 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 hard. It's challenging. Uh, the 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 work rest regulations, um, the amount of uh, rest you're supposed to have within a 24 hour period, and it's very stressful for the crew to manage that. Um, you know, a lot of times the day before transit. You know, the captain will try to be resting as much as possible, almost like putting rest in the bank, which kind of works, doesn't work. But, you know, with the rest regulations, I'd be hard pressed to find a, a ship or a company that's able to stick to it perfectly. You know, they're going to go over for a few hours during that transit. Now, you're allowed to go over for a few hours within a 24 hour period, and then you, you're supposed to make up the rest on the other side. But my concern on the transit's always been that. Well, it's hard to make it up on the other side because you just went from one high stress environment to another stress environment. You know, it takes about 12 hours of clearing the canal, whether southbound in the Red Sea or in the Med, before you get to a point where your traffic is, is you know, in a lower state and you, you have more time to deal with situations. But um, it is challenging to, to keep the rest. Uh, a lot of times what will happen is the chief officer, who is the second in command of the ship, will come up and 
and relieve the captain for a bit so the captain could, you know, sit back and put their feet up or something like that. You sometimes leave the bridge depending on the ship and depending how they're set up. You know, um, a lot of times the, the the chief officer will have a master's license, but still legally the captain is ultimately responsible if something goes wrong. So they have to be present and on the bridge, which makes for a very long day, you know, uh, and the captain's always on call. So those are issues that come up. Sometimes they'll switch the watch bill around and, and go to a, a different watch system um, to allow for that. You know, I, I've seen ships say, OK, we're going to do a 12 hour watch system. So we know half the crew is getting their rest. Uh, others have gone to a six hour on four off. There's been different rotations. It really depends on the company, the ship, the run and the amount of people on board. Um, it, one thing also is uh, we, we talk about security concerns going through the canal, and I know that comes up uh, when I was going through there years ago. It was it was always a, a hot, very hot topic. Um, you know, the Suez Canal Authority and, and uh, the Egyptian government have a very high vested interest in the canal being safe and, and staying open. You know, the tariffs of ships going through are four hundred to seven hundred thousand dollars per ship. It generates billions of dollars for for Egypt, the um, the Suez Canal. So they're very vested in keeping it safe. Most of the times, uh, I always get asked this question about pirates and piracy, and and it really doesn't happen going through the canal. What what happens is crime of opportunity on either side of the canal. And usually, if you're anchored or you're drifting, waiting for your canal transit, some characters will try to board, and they're usually trying to swipe stuff out of your lockers, whether it's paint or tools or mooring lines it's rare that it's it's um there's a risk to humans or you know they don't really go after the crew or try to rob anyone usually they're going after just what they could swipe and get their hands on it's getting less and less you know the the canal is definitely up their security and they um try to keep it as safe as possible um high value ships going through sometimes i'll have a military escort on land where there'll be military trucks that'll be kind of just pacing along on the canals as you're going through just for an added level of, of security. Um, and that usually happens. I saw a question pop up here, as you mentioned when you began, that there's about a 30 minute offset between the start times of northbound versus southbound. Uh, can you explain why that offset? So it really just has to do with the with the basically the average speed being of eight to 10 knots for the convoys going through. It's where they're going to meet up in the canal. So it's not a perfect, you know, the, the meetup point for the two lane traffic is not to perfectly in half of the canal. So you have to have that 30 minute offset to account for those that difference in mileage for them to meet for the two lanes going through. And you made um, you made reference uh, to Bitter Lake. Is that the anchorage area? You know, in terms of the percentage of the canal transit, does it account for you know quarter of it or half of it? Or so yeah, the the Bitter Lake is is closer on the southbound side of the, the Suez side of the canal, um, and, and there's your offset too because before they open up the second lane. That's where the ships would, you know, the, the ships would pass through and pass each other would be in Bitter Lake. So if the one convoy was coming too fast, they would actually pull off to the side and anchor and then wait. And the other convoy would come through and they'd pass each other that way. So that's, that was where Bitter Lake came into play. But with that second lane opening in 2016, now the, the northbound and southbound convoys pass each other uh, where that two lane section is just above Bitter Lake. What they still do, though, is they do allow for some special ships to start early than the convoys, anchor in Bitter Lake, and then join the convoys at the tail end as they're passing. So that's where the that's where Bitter Lake was used um, most of the time. You know, if a um, every ship in the convoy would have to have a pilot on board is that correct yes correct yeah that's um that's a requirement to transit the canal the suez canal pilot will be on board uh, to to take the ships through um 
there years ago you used to be able to employ a different contracted pilot and some ships were exempt from it but with the high risk of something going wrong they really want to have their pilots on board um you know also from a liability point of view if you were allowed the option not to take a pilot it you'd be hard pressed as a company or as a captain to not take it um so yeah, that'd be actually Rick. That'd be a great idea if you could pull, pull up that animation. I forgot about that. That would show what we're talking about with the convoy starting. But yeah, that's so you'd always take a pilot. Give me just one second. We'll we'll cue. That. Yeah, and I can kind of talk it through as it's happening. Now, do you see that now? Yep. Uh, so again, you see Bitter Lake is closer to the Suez side. Um, and you have the two lane section there just to the left of Bitter Lake that was opened in 2016, the top part of it. So those are the earlier ships I was mentioning that would come through a little ahead of schedule and they would then anchor off to the side of Bitter Lake. Your convoy starting 4 a.m. on the med, 3 4:30, so 30 minutes apart. Now, originally, the Suez side they would anchor, but now with that two lanes, they can pass each other. So the. the the graphic is, is a very nice and calm and synchronized and organized ballet. <laughs> it's, it's a little more dramatic than that when it's happening and you have ships jockeying for position and getting in their convoy and, you know, the, the vessel traffic is telling which ship to get in what position and no, no, this ship needs to be in front of you. This one needs to be behind you. And, and they're not small. You know, you're, you're dealing with thousand foot ships and you're trying to navigate them and move them at slow speeds get them lined up in the convoy and, and then you're going through. And, and like I was saying earlier, the biggest challenge once you're in the canal is maintaining your safe distance with the ship ahead of you and the ship behind you in the event something does go wrong. But that's a, that's one of the best uh, uh, simulations for showing an overview of the canal transit. Thanks Rick for putting that up. A question just popped up here. Um, the capacity, do you think there'll be any further expansion in the uh, in the future of the canal? I, I think I think they're always looking to see if they can expand it further. <laughs> you know, I think right now though, if I if the, the stats right now is at its current condition, it could it can take a hundred percent of the design container ships. Uh, right now, it can take two-thirds of the design tankers. Um, through and about 90% of the break bulk or bulk ships can go through in its present design. So yeah, potentially they could always dig it deeper and make it wider. Um, I believe they could, but it comes to a question of what they're going to do with the vessel sizes. I think we might be hitting a point of, of inflection with vessel sizes when it comes to the size of container ships and tankers nowadays, where getting bigger might not be better. But yeah, they, they do have the, the beauty of the Suez Canal is the, the land around it is, is very simple to dredge, which was why they were able to open it. You know, the, the original uh, architect of the Suez Canal originally tried to build a canal in Panama and failed. Then they tried in Suez and it was a little more successful due to the soil and the dirt and it's easier to dredge and, and dig out. Yeah, and just the, the fact that there are no locks and essentially the, the Suez and the Mediterranean have a, similar sea level for lack of uh, a better way of describing it. Is there any resulting current um, that is in play dependent upon the time of day and or the particular weather on either the Med, Med or the Suez side? Yeah, there, there's a little bit of a there's a little bit of a tide. Um, it's it's less than a it's less than a meter, half meter of tidal difference because but there is a seasonal um, I believe I remember wintertime, there's more of a, a current running south. Summertime is more of a current running north. So it's more of a seasonal aspect than a, than a true uh, diurnal tide cycle. Even though there, there was enough of a tide cycle for the ever given, 
with that full moon and that high tide that it was an, an, an extra few centimeters of water that helped to give lift on the ship. So it, it's very slight. Uh, it's it's nothing that you would really need to factor into navigation. You know, it's not a it's not a significant tide that's going to offset you or fight a current or having following current that would affect steerage of the ship. But it's subtle. Um, I think that's what makes it so easy to transit, though, is because of the sea levels being so close and no locks. It just makes it a much easier transit. We got a, um, questions on the autopilot. Did, I think we've kind of touched on those. Um, just a question, you know, recognizing the, the role that you play in teaching, um, you know, your own experiences with what I'll refer to as cadets, you know, to actually make your very first transit through the canal, whether you're a mate or actually a captain, uh, are there individuals that are captains on ships that they've never done the transit before? Or is there a requirement that at some point in your, your maritime career, you've got to have done it as a, you know, just going into that situation with absolutely never experiencing, I find that almost as a, not going to happen. Yeah, no, it's it depends on where you're working for your career. I mean, I, I know plenty of people that worked um, in the Pacific and just did West Coast of the U.S. to Asia and never went through the canal. I was on a round the world uh, car carrier when I went through as a navigation officer my first time as second mate. And, you know, the challenging thing was the, the ship had never been was outside of that service for five years. So it was a ordering of all new charts and the voyage planning. And that really got me into the, the figuring out the transit of the canal. And that was exciting. And then a few years later, I wound up going through it on other ships that were running to the Middle East, to Europe. So, you know, based on the nature of the ship and the trade route, I was thrusted back into it again. But, uh, you know, there's definitely careers where you you can never even go through the canal once, um, or you can go be going through it on a regular basis, on a routine basis. So it all depends on the company and the trade route that you're participating in as a mariner. Okay. Any more questions from the audience, sir? That's pretty much all I have on the Suez Canal. <laughs> Question just popped up on, uh, is there a simulator that can be used for training? Absolutely. Uh, a lot of the... Uh, a, a lot of your ship simulators can load the Suez Canal into it, and um, I know the the pilots use that at their uh, in um, their training facility. They do have a, a simulator where they put different ships going through the canal in different condi conditions, and those are things we teach at school. We can you know any of your maritime schools can take any modern simulator, and you can load the different canal scenarios into it. You can have your different ships in there with different drafts and different weather conditions to give you the effects and, and really see how the navigation is. So, yeah, a lot of simulation goes into it. That's a great part of training. It really does help. Maybe a question here as we'll wind it up, recognizing that the Institute of Navigation has uh, put this webinar on. Any type of navigation aid that you're aware of that you know you'd really like to see added to the capabilities that we have here today? You know, you talked a little bit about you know reflectors and uh, the opportunities that might come about. You know, if we were to go into uh, fully autonomous capabilities. But uh, with that said, is there any from your own experiences in navigational aids that you'd like to see? I, I think with with the Suez Canal Transit, especially anything that's land based, would would probably help more than satellite based as far as navigation, just because of the the unique nature of the canal and the, you know the proximity to land. You're when you're going through it, you are only fifty meters away from either bank. So back to what we were saying, you know, some type of um, range and reflector kind of that's used in DP for, for ships being alongside could probably benefit for helping with distancing. Um, you know, those are things I look at that would help the lar larger ships. You know, you, you have to really pay attention to the, the forces of nature on the bow of the ship, you know, 300 meters away from the stern of the ship are totally different. So, you know, in that sense, 
the, the navigation aids are more built into the ship as far as you know Doppler speed logs and, and Doppler sensors that can then allow you on the bridge to see the you know your sideways motion of the bow and stern and taking that and putting that into your 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 um Ectus unit gives you that good overview of what's going on. You know, anything that can help give a mariner the bird's eye view of what the ship is doing through the water and then what the water's doing underneath the hull of the ship. That's that's good process information that can help make decisions. And, and whether it's a helm decision or a speed decision or a course decision to help navigate through the canal safely. Those are the type of things I like to see. With that said, maybe I will turn it back over to Rick at the Institute of Navigation, close it out. But thank you very much. It's been very informative. Thank you. Appreciate it.